conflicted uh, relationship. Where, yeah. Whether yeah. you want us or not. Yeah. Or, yeah. You know, yeah. We want you, but we'll, if you're gonna if you're gonna live here, spend a little bit more of your money here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but I drive by Nordstrom's once a month. Once a month. Actually, I don't even do that anymore. But that, you know, we don't have quorum, do we? One, two, three, four, five. Well, that's not quite as Oh, we're still lower. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, Topeka's struggling. Of course, they're downtown now. They're still. I we went there too for the chocolate festival. We'd never been there before, and they. Uh, Got the walking <laughs> area downtown mm -hmm, now. Mm -hmm, That's kind of nice mm -hmm. if they can get mm -hmm. that going. It took them a long time yeah. to persuade folks to make that investment. That's a uh, smart investment. And, and, and it was, you know, the, the business community, the Go Topeka folks got behind it, and then the, and the downtown property owners and businesses got behind it, and uh, they got a lot of it paid for. All those little pocket parks. Yeah, those are most nice. of those are funded by the stores located there at the sidewalk. Those are nice. I did want to take their chocolate festival and plan it for them. <laughs> Poor execution, but you know. Inside. And did they do that downtown or was it across the river? No, it was downtown. Know, downtown. And they had it inside um, at the, what's that called? The Performing Arts Center? Yes. Very old, old yeah. facility. Yeah. 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 So. Yeah. That's Thank just you. a scoring packet. Okay. Thank you. Yep. And you got yours? Perfect. Uh, my name is Ron Gacious, and I'm the chair of the City of Lawrence's Affordable Housing Advisory Board, and uh, I'm going to call us to order this Monday, July 1st of uh, 2019. Uh, we've got a full agenda of um, great applicant presentations in response to our notice of funding uh, availability earlier this spring, and we're going to give each of those applicants an opportunity to make a presentation to the advisory board here in just a few minutes. 
But first, I'd like to ask if there are any comments from the general public. Uh, any member of the general public can come can comment now for uh, three minutes. Are there any members of the public that'd like to make a comment? Seeing none, we'll proceed to our next agenda item. Um, approval of minutes from the 2010-2019 meeting. Chair would entertain a motion to approve the minutes. We have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. <laughs> Seen none. Minutes are approved. Uh, monthly financial report. Uh, I will keep this relatively brief, but I did want to highlight that we have now received our first month of sales tax revenue for this particular um, fund. So it came in um, at just over $74,000, so I wanted to kind of make note of that. Um, and I think there was a question last time about whether it was sales and use, and I wanted to clarify that it was both sales and use tax. We get use tax on those online sales. So unless there's any questions, we can jump into the rest of the meeting. Any questions? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. Is that what we are basically uh, projecting we receive? It's, it's a little less than what our initial projections were. We've kind of seen um, sales tax is pretty volatile. Right. right. Um, so we've kind of seen a more of a plateau over the last several months. And so we're kind of seeing that here. So it is a little bit less than we initially uh, projected it to be. And it's just something that we'll keep an eye on as right. we talk about future um, notices of funding availability. Thanks. Yeah. What was the projection? What, what did you thought you'd get? So I think the, the rough number that we were looking at was just shy of about $100,000, or I think it was like $90,000 a month, or eighty-four dollars to $90,000 a month is what we initially projected. So we, so. Just, we just went from 100 where it would be 78% to 84%. So uh, we, were, we were projecting about a million dollars a year is kind of the, the rough number that we were talking about. So that, that would come out to um, $85,000 a month. So that's initially where we were. So we're at 74000 So we're, we're, we're shy of that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. Yep. Um, one other thing I might just throw in to note on sales tax is um, the state doesn't really report that um, on a standard month period. Mm -hmm. That period can differ. They, they, um, um, and so don't be alarmed if you see some fluctuations in that because it may not be that they have counted an entire month's worth of collections yes um, for a particular month that's a that's a good thing to know some some agencies will report quarterly or monthly or annually or biannually so there's always some fluctuation that we receive uh that we see kind of month over month so that's a good that's a good point mm -hmm. all right okay thank you yep uh diane regarding uh, the applicant review do we have any set policies or procedures on the link those should be I'm going to ask Danielle to comment on that because she's provided everyone instructions. Okay. Very yes. Good. And I was going to review, um, if you want me to, kind of the, pre the key project element sheet as well. Sure. Um, but we did ask applicants to be prepared today to talk about their projects for about five to ten minutes uh, and then uh, be able to answer questions from the board. Mr. Chairman, if I could uh, recuse myself from this discussion, Lawrence had a tap for humanity. Yes. Thank you, Eric. The promise of Lawrence. Yes, ma'am. They probably received that email from me. <laughs> so, I guess I have a question. Certainly. Uh, we seem to be, we lose a lot of our expertise that this group has when we have these people recruit, recuse themselves, and we're not making a decision. These are just presentations. Can those people, can they sit in on the, on the presentation piece of that? I think that it makes it difficult, even if the board isn't taking action, given the bylaw, bylaws and what mm -hmm. it says about conflicts of interest, um, that it is the safest thing for a board member to just recuse themselves and then leave the room per the policy. Um, because um, 
and, and they I, can go out. They're going to go out there and they sit and listen to it over the intercom. Yeah, I, I think I though the temptation may be to some, you know, perhaps to comment or respond comment. to a question, and and um, okay. that's the difficulty I, of the situation. I, I, I'd, I'd like to take that question though a little bit deeper and talk about a specific item that I'd like to have input from all of the board members and not have to have anyone recuse themselves. And I'd like to know when is the proper time to have that discussion. And the topic is, I, I think, you know, in light of these, I mean, these are great projects. Well, there are no losers already in our list. Any decision we make is going to advance community interest. We've got to figure out how to prioritize the opportunities. Um, we haven't ever had really a discussion about do we want do we want our dollar, these public, public dollars, to flow to a commitment made this year that then is going to be a reoccurring commitment for the next three or four years because we're now embedded in an operating budget or a, or a, or a financial revenue stream for a period of time? Or do we want to be rewarding only um, project or participating only in projects where we're one and done? We get something over the hump, then we walk away from it. Um, what kind of mix do we want to have of, of capital projects and services? And, and I, I would like for that to be kind of a, a generic discussion just to, around the parameters of what are the options out there and should, and should those kinds of considerations come into, how do those kinds of considerations play into our decision making? And, and I hate to lose the expertise of Erica and Rebecca and Shannon and you know the, the great team of professionals that we have here in the community. They're here on the advisory board in, in part because of their expertise. Um, but if they're not here in the room when we have those discussions, I think, I think we shortchange ourselves and the community by not letting them have a voice. And, and, and then when we start talking about what are we going to do with this pot of money and what are the priorities for this particular uh, uh, funding cycle, you know, they're gone. Mm -hmm. Does, how do we do that? So, Mr. Chair, I think the time to have those discussions is when you're talking about the notice of funding availability. So, um, you, you had a discussion um, a couple of meetings ago, I, I believe there was mm -hmm. kind of a series mm -hmm. of those where you're talking about um, exactly what you wanted to put in this year's notice of funding availability, and you'll have that discussion again as it comes okay. um, up to your notice of funding availability that we've discussed for November. Um, and I think that any parameters related to how the the funds may be spent are best addressed there. And okay. and the um, so we should look at it as part of the the formal offering or formal uh, notification to the public and make sure that whatever kind of constraints we want or direction we want shows up in that document. Yes, I, okay. I believe so. Mm -hmm. Although, um, you know, I would say that sometimes it is a little bit difficult to predict what kind of applications that you get right. in. So you can put yourself in a, in a box and maybe define things too narrowly and mm -hmm. then you think, oh, I wish we would have not done it quite that much, but those are things I think you can discuss as you deliberate. Okay. And then one of your other parts of your question um, perhaps has a little bit of a different answer. So with this round of funding, there is $250,000 available per what you have, have put out in the notice mm -hmm. round. Um, and you have at least uh, one application that is speaking to um, some future funding mm -hmm. commitment. Um, the, uh, the future funding commitment is a, is a possibility, um, but it does um, um, require a bit of discussion, I think, with our city commission. And also, we have to be aware that we are not constraining ourselves in terms of um, a law that the city has to comply with called the cash basis law, mm -hmm. um, which mm -hmm. is that we, we can only spend this year's budgeted funds and we can't bind a future um, commission mm -hmm. to um, decisions. Um, but there are um, times when that can be done, um, but that needs to be um, carefully structured and, and discussed. For example, the city, um, we issue bonds and finance things over time. So a commitment to issue those bonds in this year that we may be paying for for the next 10 years 
is something that we 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 do routinely and cities do so those are some things that we have to to talk about i think if we are talking about future pots of money but for this discussion now the way that you've set it up it's for this 250 um, that that is available now in, in terms of cash in your fund great that's a great update overview yeah. any other questions comments about the process um, well let's kick it off Lawrence uh, Habitat for Humanity, please come forward and introduce yourself. Good morning. I'm John Harvey with Lawrence Habitat for Humanity. We appreciate the opportunity to present our proposal this morning. Uh, our project is two units of permanently affordable ownership workforce housing. The first unit is the renovation of a three-bedroom foreclosure. Uh, that is in Habitat's inventory. The second project is new construction of a five-bedroom home. Uh, the new home will be built to Energy Star 2.0 standard, and the renovation um, will try as much as we can to, to meet that standard um, in that renovation. Uh, the foreclosure renovation is um, ready to start in September and would be completed by the end of this year. New construction would start shortly after in October and be completed um, next spring. Both the units are located in, in North Lawrence. Um, when completed, Lawrence Habitat would be on both projects would be issuing a 0% mortgage for up to 30 years guaranteed uh, payments to be less than 27% of the um, homeowner's um, income. In terms of the two families being served in this project, they are both families uh, with female heads of households, and there are six children being served between uh, these, um, these two households. One head of household currently um, um, it has a housing authority rental a voucher, so completing her unit would free up that, that housing voucher and is an opportunity to kind of close the affordable housing loop, so to speak, in, in Lawrence, taking a family from precarious housing to stabilized, subsidized, and um, then uh, with this project to a permanently affordable home of their own. Both heads of households are currently employed um, in Lawrence. Both have incomes that are under 60% of the area uh, median. Both of these homeowners have been working for the past year to prepare themselves for this opportunity, completing their um, approximately 30 hours of home buyer education classes and completing 200 sweat equity hours, um, which will include, both of them will be involved in building their, uh, their own home. In terms of the project cost, total project cost is $318,960, of which Habitat has already raised $268,960. Um, of that, $188,960 is cash that's currently in our accounts designated um, for um, each of these projects, then there's 80,000 of in-kind um, involved. Both these projects have a local sponsor. The renovation is sponsored by uh, the Building on Faith Coalition of Lawrence Churches. The new construction is sponsored by um, the Women Build Committee of Lawrence. Both these sponsors have been um, working with us for the past year to raise these dollars. Despite those sponsors' very best efforts over the last 12 months, there's still a funding gap for each of these projects, hence our proposal. Our request is for 50,000, divided uh, up 22,000 for the gap for the foreclosure renovation, 28,000 for new construction. Our request represents 15% of the total project cost. We've achieved over a one to six um, leverage ratio on private funds raised uh, compared to our request. This works out to be $6,250 per bedroom. 
We want to emphasize that there are no developer fees involved um, in this project. Uh, the $28,560 in overhead and administration costs necessary to carry out this project um, are contributed by other sources outside of this grant request. There will be about 1,800 volunteer hours per unit involved in this project. Um, that's Habitat's model to help drive down the overall cost of production. The Affordable Housing Trust Fund dollars will be used specifically to purchase building materials and to pay licensed subcontractors necessary on um, either of the projects. So in summary, um, the, the social outcomes for the project are two units of um, permanently affordable ownership housing, two local employees already contributing to our local economy will uh, enjoy a permanent housing solution. One um, housing voucher will be freed up. Um, and then there's a financial um, return on investment, if you will, um, given a projection of uh, property taxes on this project. All of our homeowners pay full, um, full property taxes based upon the appraised value of the home. So um, an estimation of the property taxes would mean that um, in less than 14 years, the full 50,000 would be repaid to the city of Lawrence through property taxes. And over the life of the mortgage, um, that 50,000 would be doubled. So um, this is our project. We're excited about it. We feel it's an it's a, a excellent opportunity to close the affordable housing um, loop um, in Lawrence, and we um, hope you'll receive our project positively. With that, um, I'll answer any questions you might have. Daniel, thank you. Questions? I, I have a question yes. about the renovation. The renovation was originally a habitat built? Yes, it's our, in our 30 year history, um, this is the first um, home. We built it about 14 years ago, and we had to foreclose um, on, on this property. So now we are um, renovating it uh, and providing it to a new habitat so homeowner. Yeah, yeah. When it was built, were there any city dollars which were put in? There were not. Okay. It was totally privately funded when it was built. Thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. Were these units uh, ultimately permanently affordable, or yes. are they affordable to the first owner? Did I miss that? No, permanently affordable. They'll be tied down with a deed and uh, restrictions. So okay. when these homeowners sell, they must sell to a qualified under 60% homeowner. And there's a formula for how they get portion of the equity and so forth when it's sold. Okay. Yeah, it's not new. We've done that. Um, worked with the city and done right, that before. Right. Yeah. I just didn't catch that. Either. Yeah. What would be the impact of those projects, the two units, if Ahab was unable to fund this project at this time? Yeah, it, it really comes down to a pretty simple decision for, for Habitat. Either um, we look at the funds that have been contributed to either project and figure out um, are there funds that are not specifically designated for a certain project that maybe we can slide to one? It means we have to choose one project to, to move ahead. Um, and then the other homeowner waits until we can raise um, more dollars. Or if the funds are kind of you know, we can't move designated dollars. So if each unit has designated dollars, then both homer, homeowners just have to wait. So the renovation homeowner is already in that circumstance. Um, we had hoped to start that project last month, so it's being delayed because we have that, that funding gap. You know, there, there is a limit on charitable dollars that can be raised in Lawrence. There's, there's only so much in that pool and you can't keep going back to either individual or corporate donors over and over. So it's a challenge that we um, face all the time and frankly we believe that government funding has a role to play for a small amount of 
uh, of match when typically we raise 85% of a, of a project. So that's the choices. Um, I know that there's a, um, an organization, Be More Like Claire, that yes. submitted, and that fundraiser is this week. That's right. So are those dollars already designated for a bill? Yes, for a project next, next year. Next year, Yes, okay. so typically we work with sponsors like Be More Like Claire, or in this case, Women Build or Building on Faith. We start working with them a year in advance and hope to, to hit the target, but often there's a gap. So yes, their fundraiser is this Friday, I think. Other questions? Appreciate your Thank time. you very much, Daniel. Tips mm -hmm. to homeowners. Good morning. Good morning. Greetings, everyone. Uh, Nicholas Ward, and I'll be speaking on behalf of Tennis to Homeowners. Rebecca has obviously had to recuse herself from presenting. Um, in the project that we're presenting for, I know you have it before you, but it's for the acquisition of seven lots. They would be at the intersection of 19th and Boleyn. And this is a completely new development on space that was previously um, uh, zoned for, what would it be, industrial use? Um, so in the past year or so, I know coming to a number of meetings in these chambers that there's been a lot of discussion about um, the difference between single serving affordability and permanent affordability when it comes to the discussion of housing. Uh, as the stewards of public funds and advisors for affordable housing in this community, um, it's been acknowledged that those developments that are in permanent affordability are the most desirable for the effects that they have in the long term on our uh, community's housing. This is the model practiced by tenants to homeowners as the community land trust, and this is the model proposed in the partnership at the intersection of Boleyn and 19th. Uh, many voices in the city, uh, from neighborhoods to the city commission, have been asking for collaborations between not-for-profit and for-profit developers in affordable housing. The development before you supports infill development of single-family homes, and it supports greater density, smaller home sizes, smaller lots for these developments. It is a for-profit, not-for-profit development partnership. The proposed collaboration is between TTH and Keller. Uh, it is an effort to destigmatize affordable housing and mixed-income housing. It is a mixed-income development in which low-income houses are directly neighboring market rate units. So you'll see, um, if you have it there before you, that again, of the 13 houses, seven of them would be permanently affordable housing, and these would be neighboring homes, so right next to each other. The proposed project serves as a pilot for two initiatives. One, it's the first development of any type, as far as I know, on RS3 zoning in the community and the first not-for-profit, for-profit collaboration in Lawrence for mixed income development in home ownership. We've seen that a little bit in rental, but this would be the first in permanent home ownership. Platting for this project has already been through the Planning Commission, has been uh, approved to go forward through that body. Um, and I believe TTH and Keller are ready to go on this project. And if there are any questions specifically about a timeline, I know some of that would have to be directed towards planning, so Scott might be able to answer a couple of those questions for you. Um, when we're looking at this project, a couple of the things that we're thinking about in terms of community impact are that it's infill development, that it's a bikeable location, it's utilizing the Burroughs Creek Trail, it's proximity to grocery stores, to schools, to downtown, to bus stops, and to the East Lawrence Rec Center, and that it's also right there on three thoroughfares, so you have 15th Street, Haskell, um, Connecticut and then also not that far from Massachusetts so really um, kind of an ideal location for this um, we'd also talked about that it tends to homeowners one of the biggest populations that we're serving is people who actually work in supportive services so having SRS and other places like that nearby um, we were talking a little bit about our marketing campaign that we would be distributing most of our marketing for sales of these houses to folks who are already working in the area and thinking a little bit about bikeability and how people are uh, commuting there. Um, and I think, so, so for, for the dollars, we're seeking $150,000 from the Housing Trust Fund, um, and $220,000 is what that would be leveraging, and that would be coming from um, the 
other grant funding sources that we have, and also if we're able to purchase all seven of those uh, lots, there would be a match coming from Keller as well as an incentive for us to do a few more spaces there. Um, so in short, we're seeking $150,000 from the Housing Trust Fund uh, for these seven lots. And again, these would be in permanent affordability. Um, this would be a mixed use development with market rate and affordable housing as neighbors. Um, and then we'd also talked a little bit about how housing has traditionally functioned for tenants to homeowners. Usually when we bring someone into uh, one of our permanently affordable houses, they stay for five to seven years before they move on uh, because they've had growth in their family or to um, they're moving on to the open market. And so we talked a little bit about what it means, especially when you talk about permanently affordable housing for $150,000 subsidy to be put into seven homes, seven lots, and then what that actually expands to be over time. And so we did, we ran the numbers a little bit, and so over the course of 30 years, we'd be serving roughly 40 different families with this $150,000 subsidy, allowing them to pay probably less than what they would have been paying for market rate rent, and to build equity uh, that whole time, and to move on to other housing or to move directly into the market. Um, if you have any questions or if there's anything I skipped that you wanted to talk about in the application, um, please let me know. Thank you. Um, quick follow-up question about uh, your impact numbers that you just uh, talked about. Mm -hmm. uh, over 30 years serve approximately 40 families uh, with the development of these seven units. That's That forecast is based on the current turnover recent turnover that you have in the units? Yeah, so that's looking okay. at our turnovers in the last decade or so, okay. and about how often someone uh, moves in and then sells their housing back into affordability. And, and, and what is that cycle right now? So right now it's five years, but five we're years. giving a little, yep. Smart a lot about, this is obviously get the lots and all that, so the funding's in place to build the houses and do all the rest of the project. This would be seven houses that we would get built. Yeah, so this is for the, the acquisition of the lots. We're mm -hmm. uh, pulling $200,000 uh, from the Federal Home Loan Bank, and then also um, $20,000 if we're able to purchase. All seven of the lots would be coming from Keller as an incentive to right. have more of those in affordability. Um, and so about specifically about funding already available for the houses, I would have to check with Rebecca on that. But the developer's planning to pay for the construction of the homes, correct? For the construction of the homes that are market rate, yes, and for the construction of the homes that are uh, that would be going into trust, that would be on tenants to homeowners. Okay. Mm -hmm. So then can I get to the root of my question? If we fund this and yeah. you buy the seven, you get the seven lots, will there be seven houses built in the next 18 months. Yes, and I think our mod okay. the model I'm remembering now that we had talked about is that versus building all seven at once, that we would build two houses, sell those and kind of go forward in that way so that we'd be leveraging the money that we have available to continue building. Yeah, by the so end of what's, what's your build time per house? I mean, for, if to build two houses, right? How long? Um, I would again, I would have to check with Rebecca on that. Sorry, um, but I know that when we were going over it, that the beginning of the development on our end in terms of construction of the houses, if the lots were able to be acquired, mm -hmm. was in the spring of 2020 and wrapping in the fall of 2020 for completion of all the houses. Mike, I just want to make sure that we don't buy the lots and then the houses are built, right? Because right? this is to buy the lots. So that's all I was trying to get to. Mm -hmm. So if you make sure that's you have to ready to roll right away or through the planning commission and you just have to get the building permits and that kind of thing? I believe so. Scott, um, when it went through planning, there were some questions, but. Um, so this application represents um, the first one that has some, maybe some ripeness questions. Every one of these has varying levels of immediacy to it. 
um, the tenants to home, home homeowners application with the planning commission last week with recommendation for approval goes to the city commission in August and we'll get its final determination at that point um, so it's it has potential to be an approved shovel ready project at that point um, habitat is shovel ready at this point from what I understand the two locations are and the other ones are going to have varying levels of whether they're immediately available or if they still have actions to go before um, on land use entitlements so we can talk about that at whatever point mr. chair you want to but they do all come with different different levels of that sure mm -hmm. and obviously any award is would be contingent upon receiving those entitlements of all land use building code that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. and the the initial questions that had come for us from community members were when we're building a little tighter development like this um, what does parking look like in that space because it's kind of an unusual for service vehicles to access a fire truck and so um, with these houses will have garages and have space available for two-car parking um, and there was also a little bit of pushback, I feel like, just with the idea of RS3 lots in general. Um, and so even though they are permitted, that's, I think, being a new thing, folks are going to feel a little apprehensive until they see what they, what they look like when they're built upon. And again, this is, you know, directly what's called for in the BBC housing market analysis, that we do more infill, that we shrink lot sizes a little bit, and um, we start thinking about what density means if we don't want um, just apartment buildings or something like that. So, I, I did have a follow-up question um, on, on the number of units. Do you have a forecast? Do, do the do, do seven number of units correspond to a, uh, a number of bedrooms yet? Yeah. So they would all for ours. They would be two bedroom. Two bedroom each yep. unit. Okay. Yep. Couple, couple threes. Yeah, there so there's two threes, threes in there as well. Okay. And then it was you had asked a question of the previous applicant about what what that would look like if not all the funds were awarded. Yes. Sir. And so for us, what we had talked about is that we're fully invested in doing this project, and that it would receiving less funds would just scale back the number of lots that we're able to acquire and the number of houses we're able to build in affordability. I think those lots would all still be built, but more of them would be market rate instead of affordable. With uh, material costs being kind of volatile, is there any kind of backup plan if material costs start to become a problem? Had it with markets and tariffs, you mean? Yeah, yeah I, don't, I don't know for sure. I would have to check again with our contractor on that. And, Any other questions? Thank you very much. Cool. Thank you. Uh, representative of uh, Wheatland Investment Group. Good morning. I'm Good morning. Kelsey Hare, and this is Dave Rhodes. We're with uh, Wheatland Investment Group. Just thought we'd give you a quick recap of our company to start out with. We are a family-owned company. We've been doing this for quite a few years. We um, currently have the Lawrence Phase 1 senior property. We presented um, to the state of Kansas for tax credit projects for 42 additional units for our Phase 2. We have already been awarded that, um, so we are ready to begin. I know that keeps becoming a question, so I thought I'd let you know now. We are ready to go. We have our financing. We have our zone. Um, all we have to do is submit our um, plans to get our building permits and we're shovel ready. Um, I thought I'd just give you another recap. I know you guys have all this information in front of you. Uh, it is 42 units and we believe that us doing the 42 units of affordable will help reach the 100 goal that you all have previously set. Um, they are affordable. We have to sign saying that they will stay affordable for at least 30 years. I know that's not permanently, but 30 years is still a, quite a long time to keep them affordable. We are offering both one and two bedroom units at the 50 and 60% rate. 
We are having everything be energy rated at 75% or better. I can tell you we already have a wait list since we do have a phase one. We have over 60 people currently on our wait list with 42 units. I don't think that'll be a problem to fill them as soon as they're built. Um, to help back our wait list, we did have a market study done. That also proves that there is a demand for this senior project. It is located at 25th and O'Connell, just right down the road. Um, we also are requesting the 350,000 and at the time we were unaware that you were going to set the limit of the 250,000. So at this point, um, we would like to request up to the 250,000 and then potentially come back to request for the additional next round. I know that you guys um, were also wondering about leverage <clears throat> and our project, if um, we do the $8 million project with the 350,000 of the affordable funds, it, we believe that that's a 23 times leverage. Um, our units are constructed well. If you drive by, we don't require a lot of maintenance every year to have to come back and get more funds to keep everything looking the same as it did when we built it. It seems to speak for itself and stand for itself. We also are self-managed, um, so not only do we build it, own it, we then operate it and keep everything in the Wheatland Investments control. Do you have anything you'd like to add? No, we just appreciate the opportunity to have a public-private partnership uh, to bring affordable housing to Lawrence. Uh, we've been very successful in phase one. We expect phase two to be just as successful. If any of you haven't had a chance to go out and look at that project, you ought to go by. Uh, we don't have any vacant units to get you inside, <laughs> but uh, it, it's a nice project. We build a class A property at an affordable price. Mm -hmm. What, what happens to the units at the end of the 30-year affordable housing commitment? Two choices. You can either sell it and remain uh, under affordability, mm -hmm. or you can request a waiver out of the program at that point um, so that you can then become a market rate property. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's it, it goes <coughs> beyond my scope. Yeah. I can tell you thus far, um, we have not sold any of our projects that we have done. We have chose to keep them, uh, keep them affordable. Mm -hmm. Every project that we've built, we still own. And, mm -hmm. uh, and we've uh, been doing it for about 25 years. How, how many projects do you have in your portfolio then that are similar to this? I would say about 12. 12? And you're uh, owner-operator of all of them? Yeah. We're in Kansas, Missouri, uh, Kansas, Oklahoma, and Texas. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Staff actually had a question um, on this one. Certainly. Sure. That's okay. Scott, go right ahead. Um, so I think one of the things that we're learning about through this particular round is these um, LIHTC projects, these low-income housing tax credit projects at a 9% level, which really, for the, traditionally speaking, fills the gap on low-income housing projects. So um, looking toward affordable housing trust fund dollars as another source of funding, I think one of the questions and discussion points we'd like the board to have is, you know, is the trust fund dollars an appropriate funding source for LIHTC projects that are getting their gaps filled by other means including low-income housing tax credits. So I think that's a question popping up through this round with two LIHTC question, um, projects. So really the question I think to the applicants is, knowing that kind of discussion is going to occur with, with this round, what, how do you respond to the need for trust fund dollars given the LIHTC exists and you've had that award already? It really gets to the, our question about what would happen if you didn't get trust fund dollars 
to what would happen to the project? How would that affect your project? Uh, Scott, I think what happens is if the LIHTC request that everybody makes as far as developer side, uh, you have to put that with a, a loan, a deferred developer fee, and a syndication fee. Depending on the pricing that you get for the tax credits when you sell those, those create gaps. Um, so that when you, you have to work on this almost two years in advance, the cost of construction, the gap filler that, that's created, and maybe the pricing of the tax credits, there's lots of variables that don't come together until after you get the award letter. And then once you get the award letter, you go out to the syndicators, you go out to the lenders, maybe interest rates have increased, so your loan is now smaller. It creates a gap. And, and that's why I think the city having an affordable housing program like you do can help fill those gaps for developers like us because uh, uh, there's limited choices out there for us to go get that money. And I think, uh, I think what the city is doing is fantastic. Uh, and and we, we can't fill all the gap with uh, deferred developer fee, financing, syndication cost. There's still a gap. I think a follow-up for the board is, is um, using um, our partner, NDC, Jeff Jewell, who you, who's often here but couldn't be here today, to maybe have a follow-up discussion with you about how a lot of this stuff gets financed. Mm -hmm. Um, just so we fully understand it. Every, every NOFA we do, I think, is going to be a learning experience. And I think this starts some of that experience for us. Uh, yes, other comment? I did, I did have a follow-up question sure. um, for Mr. Rose. Um, so with, um, with your phase one project that didn't have a subsidy, the, it just worked out that the financing um, occurred such that there there wasn't a sufficient gap to c call off the project in that particular case? No, I think the uh, there's still a gap in phase one. We just deferred it so that we can get paid out over the next 10 to 12 years okay. of funds that we had to inject to fill that gap. So the gap still existed in phase one. We went ahead and did the project uh, because we were awarded the tax credits and we wanted to bring this project to Lawrence, to the east side of Lawrence. So the 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 bottom line is we'll have to fund it and hope at some point that we can get it reimbursed back to us over time. Thank you. Yes. I'm wondering in uh, other cities where you've done projects, have you um, turned to like affordable housing funds to fill the gap and has that changed the relationship any with the company? Uh, other cities are not offering what you guys are offering, and I think that is fantastic that you guys are offering. Okay. We've gone and we've gone to other cities and asked for in kind like reduced building permit fees, uh, city participation on the infrastructure. Uh, we've asked for those things. A lot of other cities uh, are not doing what you guys are doing, and I think this is helping stimulate bringing affordable housing to Lawrence. Okay, so uh, if you were to receive funding, that would, uh, have you thought about how that might, after 30 years, um, influence or come into play to the conversation about what might happen after 30 years about affordability? We, we intend to keep it affordable. I mean, so our, our goal is to keep it affordable. Can I jump in on your question? Yeah. So if we were, I don't even know if we can do this. If we were to say yes to this project under the condition that they were permanently affordable, would that be something you guys would entertain? I'm not asking you to answer today, but would you entertain that conversation given your stance currently? Or is that I would contractually say, impossible for you? I don't think it's contractually I think would, impossible. I think we would entertain yeah, a okay. discussion of that, yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> I had the same question. <laughs> okay. Good conversation. Other questions? Um, I guess so there's 42 units here. That's 70 bedrooms. Does that mean this entire complex is affordable, or is Correct. are there 
No, market we, rate we are units. doing no market rates. It's okay. 100% okay. affordable. Yeah. All sure. phase one as well. Correct. Correct. So it'll be 90 units of affordable on this phase one and two. Okay. <laughs> Almost to your 100. And it's 55 and a half, right? Correct. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Very okay. good. Thank you very much. Thank you. If you t the way you talked about uh, there's a gap and you fill that at the end of the project, if this funding got deferred six months, would that have an impact on you got your ability to do this project? It'll take us 14, 15 months to build the project, so no, it would not. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that might, since they were asking for 350000 originally. Mm -hmm. We can't fulfill that regardless of what no. we do. Mm -hmm. So, but we have future right opportunities. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Yes. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Amy Ballinger, and this is Bob McKessick, and we're with Independence Inc. And I too would like to give just a brief background of who and what we are. We're a center for independent living, which means we're a community-based nonprofit organization. Um, we're non-residential. Um, we are not a medical model, which allows us to serve um, a great number of consumers. Um, they self-report, and we serve any type of disability. Um, and so it allows us to serve a, a, a broad base with ease and no red tape and that sort of thing. Um, our mission is to maximize the independence of people with disabilities through advocacy, peer support, training, transportation, and community education. And one of those programs that we offer is a housing program. And so we are, our purpose today is to bring um, to the conversation the essential element of accessibility into the affordable housing landscape. Um, we truly feel that you cannot separate those two um, issues and we'll talk about more about that in just a little bit. So under our housing services, we currently do offer an affordable housing program that is funded by the city and we thank you for that. Um, and I'll let Bob talk a little bit more about this, but um, we have recently, um, our eyes have been open to um, some red tape in that program that will virtually eliminate a big portion of the people that we serve. And we're kind of facing a crisis situation if we don't find additional funding to um, serve this great gap. Um, so currently, well in the past, we have been able to um, serve people in rental units, um, apartment complexes, trailer courts, that sort of thing. People. Um, with the lowest incomes in our in our um, areas, and because of some restrictions um, with uh, income verification, we're we're facing really cutting off a broad section of our of our consumer group. Um, so I'm going to let Bob talk about the overview of this um, proposal, and then I'll jump back in with some more information. Thank you, mm -hmm. Bob. Thanks. <coughs> so part of the uh, need for the ability to pay for accessibility modifications is that historically the right to modify a rental unit just uh, became part of the fair housing law in 1988. So tenants had the right to make reasonable accessibility modifications if they needed a, an entrance ramp to get in or widening doors, installing grab bars in the bathroom next to the tub, shower, or toilet, putting in an accessible height toilet, possibly removing the tub shower and putting in a no-step accessible shower that, you, that it's often referred to as a roll-in shower, but you can also transfer to it from a walker or crutches or, or a wheelchair and transfer to a shower chair with a transfer bench and use a handheld shower 
uh, sometimes the only modification needed is to add the handheld hose to the existing uh, where the water comes out in a shower and then maybe add grad bars and if you can transfer over the edge of the tub then you're good to go so we're usually looking at practical modifications that are cost effective of course so renters have that right to make the modification but the landlord or the property owner has no obligation to contribute to the cost so that's why community development block grant money nationwide has been used and that's our current accessible housing program serves renters only um, of low to moderate income that need to modify where the landlord chooses not to use the state tax credit there is an accessibility tax credit available to businesses of all type including housing but our experience has been since our program uh, started in 89 that the vast majority of landlords choose not to contribute because the law doesn't require them to so um, the change that we learned of during this year's community development block grant monitoring review is whenever the proposed the person applying who has low income and the vast majority of people we served in in this program have been in the low or very low income category and very few in the moderate um, uh, is that if they're part of a multifamily dwelling or a mobile home park then all resident then 51 percent of all residents in the multifamily dwelling we have to get income documentation to demonstrate that 51 percent meet the low to moderate income category even though the other residents are not really benefiting from the structural change the accessibility improvement that would just occur in one unit or in one mobile home uh, so that's going to make it very difficult and impossible to, to gain that cooperation. I think we would almost have to go door to door in person and explain, you know, get permission from the applicant to explain what is being proposed, show them the, the HUD regulation that requires this level of documentation, and then turn in the application to request approval from the city. So, that's why we're one of the main reasons we're seeking to uh, create more flexibility and more timely response for an applicant who's low income who needs to modify uh, a place they're renting or even a homeowner uh, of low to moderate income so that those changes could be made in a timely manner and they could either have an accessible entrance or be able to use the aspects different components in the bathroom independently and safely uh, so that that that's kind of a the major change of our current program which is limited to renters we've been referring homeowners because we have been approached by a lot of homeowners with low incomes to the city's emergency no interest loan but that can only be used once per lifetime and often and it has a lot more flexibility so it's it's called an emergency furnace slash or, or furnace slash emergency loan because it's often used to replace furnaces air conditioning or repair the roof or if, if your insurance doesn't cover everything or, or the porch so uh, we're proposing to serve anywhere from six to 15 people per year, depending on what the modifications are, it's really difficult to project who's, gonna, who's coming forward with the need for modifications. We do, we do use licensed contractors and require that people conform to local code whenever making a change so that it's in compliance with local code. As, and we use the Americans with Disabilities Act accessibility standard as a starting point for writing bid specifications. Uh, we send bid specifications of probably 10 or more contractors, inviting them to bid and go with a low bid. We'll, we meet people on site when they, when they wanna meet us there to explain the 
the proposed change. Like if it's a ramp, we try to install it. Um, so there's a, a level deck, or sometimes in a mobile home, we're replacing the deck so there's enough maneuvering space. So a chair user or person using a walker or a scooter is on a level surface when they're maneuvering and to the side of the door, opening the door, and then they can go in. So they have enough level surface, and then the ramp is going off that and ending either on an existing sidewalk or the driveway. So they have a fully accessible route to get from where they're getting off the bus or out of a vehicle to get in their home. Uh, when we wide, when doors are widened, there's every effort's made. The bid specs say, you know, matching trim and door that is consistent with other doors. So if you're widening a bathroom door and it so it matches all the bedroom doors, if that's the way the current uh, home is, is designed. So the intention is that the improvements remain to benefit future tenants or uh, future people living in the home. The law allows landlords to condition their approval that certain things be restored if they believe that it's going to interfere with renting the unit in the future. Homeowners, of course, aren't faced with that because they're going to market it as universal design or a home suited to age in place. Uh, the fact that more people want to age in place is another thing that's driving the need, increasing the need for these kind of changes. Oh, so back to the Fair Housing Act. It only, that new construction requirement, they did have a new construction requirement, but it don't, in 90, anything built after March of 91 that had four or more units per building. So it had to have basic access, which just meant a no-step entrance and all the doorways wide enough, and enough maneuvering space in the kitchen and bathroom, the rooms typically smaller than the others, so that a chair user or, or a, user, a person using any sort of assistive device could approach all the fixtures in that room, either front ways or sideways. But no knee clearance was required under the sink, uh, in the kitchen or, or uh, bathroom and any kind of tub configuration could be put in that, that uh, you wanted. So it, it was more like universal design. It had the basic, basic features. Uh, so even in multifamily dwellings, there's often a need to make a change if a person needs a greater level of accessibility. So like use the sink facing forward instead of sideways and then pouring a cup over using a cup to rinse both hands and uh, it's really hard to do the dishes this way. <laughs> so usually if you're a homeowner, you're gonna make that change because you've got plenty of other cabinet space and uh, accessible sinks in the bathroom uh, can be made where there's countertop space so it's functional, not just the edge of the, of the sink and you have pull out drawers to one side. So homeowners are they usually are in homes that are a little bit bigger, except in the affordable housing arena, you're still, we're still challenged by the historic, um, historically houses being built with steps and small, smaller bathrooms and kitchens. So there's less maneuvering space, but we use every available option. Uh, and just to recognize tenants and homeowners in 2005, adopted a universal design policy they apply to all housing they build or uh, develop when it's feasible to do so in existing that has those basic access features and both habitat and tenants to homeowners will incorporate higher level of accessibility when the person occupying that home needs <coughs> that so we do want to recognize and applaud that we're our program is designed to fill the, the gap in the, just the general housing market. That, and if a person has a Section 8 voucher, then they sometimes have access to those newer units, uh, multifamily units that have basic access. So the cost is, at least we're not having to deal with creating an entrance, it's usually things in the bathroom. So, uh, that's kind of what Thank you very much, Sorry. Bob. Yeah. Okay. 
So just to piggyback on a couple of things, mm -hmm. um, you know, we stated in, in our um, application, we, our goal was six to eight um, consumers and their families, if they have families, would be our goal to meet. But like Bob said, that's very flexible. We would love to be able to meet more needs. Um, and we have um, plans in place to try to do that, one of which, as he has talked about already, is trying to partner with other organizations, such as Habitat for Humanity and their Aging in Place program, if we could you know, do look at interior modifications that need to be done if they're doing some exterior things. Um, that would be a place where we could um, save some money. Um, ramps are the most expensive, so if we're doing all exterior, then that eats up the budget quite a bit. So um, although we do give precedence to um, safe entrance and exit into the home, that certainly is our first goal, is to be able to get people safely in and out of their homes. Um, we would love to partner with other community organizations to um, allow us to do some interior um, accessibility modifications, which are generally lower cost. So hopefully that consumer count would rise more to what Bob talked about. Um, we I also want to piggyback on the fact that we really do want to work with landlords to make this, so I'm going to talk about the broader picture for just a minute. There's the immediate need just to get um, people with disabilities safely in their home and to be able to function in and around their home. Um, there's also this broader need to make this the norm and um, to educate and inform people um, of the need for accessible housing. It's in our mission to do that. It's part of our core services. It's what we already do. So we are already well equipped to educate landlords. Um, I think I'd like to even expand that a little bit to where we gave them kind of some packets of information showing them pictures of what accessibility modifications could look like. Um, we are working on and have been for a while a list of landlords that um, are cooperative to, oh, excuse me, to allowing accessibility modifications and um, they would be part of that broader list. Um, I'm a marketing professional as well as um, the coordinator for the AHP program and so I would, ha I have a broad base of knowledge to help them understand the marketing of their units um, if they choose to keep the um, accessibility modifications. Mm -hmm. So that is our goal, not just to meet the needs of those six to eight people um, or 10 or 15 that we would be serving, but to make this an educational opportunity so that these landlords will keep these units and um, have that in their mind to continue thinking accessibility as they expand. And um, you know, as you know, we're, we have that affordable housing crisis we're adding that new, that not new, that element of accessibility. If you can imagine that gap, you think about the gap in affordable housing. Um, most of the housing that is affordable out there, you know, is like Bob said, the um, the apart older apartment complexes and older homes that did not have to um, adhere to any accessibility standards. And so we can, you know, tell people which apartments are are affordable, but if they're not accessible, we we can't serve our consumers. So so that's our program in a nutshell. Um, yeah, I think we kind of covered up, covered everything and probably spent a little more of our time. So thank you for listening and we're, we are open to any questions. Any questions for Amy? I'm gonna grab my pen. Uh, yes. Um, I was wondering um, for the um, the ownership, home ownership yes. portion of the program, so would there be any provisions in the program that would require repayment of the funds related to the improvements if the home sells within a certain period? Um, so that's a good question. We hadn't, we, that's not something that we had tacked onto that. It's a good point of discussion and we are definitely open to that. Um, our thinking is that if someone in this low to extremely low or even mod income level is able to purchase a house and make accessibility modifications, they are probably not going anywhere anytime soon. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a very reasonable assumption. Um, so it would be reasonable to tack on something like that, absolutely, um, to, to, to maintain the affordability. And of course, it would then become a, an, an accessible home and marketed as such. Um, but extending this to home ownership is something that would be new to the program, right? Because it's just yes, only for renters. Yes, because there was our original program, the the the, the limit, um, the regulations imposed on that could only be um, uh, accessed by renters. Yes. Thank you. 
Yes, sir. Uh, so it's one one funding. Yes. So is this ten units would be funded by one hundred thousand dollars, or does that mean you're going to do t about twenty units? No. So we're only asking. Okay. So are you? Ha you're talking <laughs> combining the two programs? Yeah, combining with the matching yes. funds and our and the funds. Yeah. We would potentially Yes. Minutes. So how many units total? Would so that would be double that. That would be double. you know so you, twenty plus. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I guess the. So we would continue. If you don't get funding, you're going to be able to do about 10 units this year. Yes, exactly. Well, I mean, give or take. I don't realize the Theoretically, numbers. but again, because of the limits on that program that we now have to abide by. You can't do that. We would, we would, we're just not sure what that's going to look like for the upcoming right. year. I mean, we are, we will do our best to utilize that money, and we're still, of course, anticipating that community block grant funding. Sure. Um, we will have to creatively figure out how to reach people. Um, and again, as a marketing right. and outreach professional, I have hopes that we can do that, even given the specific limitations. Um, but it's going to be very difficult and timely. And um, so we're anticipating these funds, yes, to at least double our um, ability. And we have the staff in place to do that. We have the expertise in place to do that. And we have a well-rounded expertise with marketing and outreach. And um, Bob is our program manager, and we have Daniel, who's our independent living skills professional. And I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm looking at my our evaluation, and that should be 20 units of rehab if we're comparing it to the other. Mm -hmm. to, to make it apples and oranges. To make it apples and apples. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, that makes sense. With the funding. Yeah, thank you for that clarification. Okay. Yes, sir. Your specific goal is to make affordable housing accessible for those who need it, correct? Absolutely. Okay. Yes. Yeah. On a case by case basis, this this would not be working. Um, this would be working with consumers first, and through that avenue reaching the landlord. So we would not be approaching landlords saying you need to do this, that, or the other, because that's not a, a, a um, legal way to do it. So we would be approaching, um, or we would be handling the consumers as the application comes in, and through that avenue, then we have access to the landlords or management companies. So. All right, thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have uh, Housing Authority and Family Promise. PowerPoint here, but my name is Nikki Danke. I'm the Director of Housing Assistance with the Lawrence Douglas County Housing Authority. And I'm Brenda Wall with Family Promise of Lawrence. Good morning. Good, Good afternoon. Morning. Good afternoon. Thank yeah. you for this good opportunity. Thanks for having us. Um, we're here to discuss the New Horizons program. Um, we've had this program as a partnership with the city and county um, and Family Promise and Lawrence Community Shelter since 2016. We were here at the table uh, and were, was awarded in 2018 this fund. We received um, 110000 which was 60% of our ask, to cover the cost of tenant-based rental assistance, TBRA, <laughs> including deposit supports and case management. So, so since 2016, we've been able to help 65 individuals, which breaks down to 15 families. Um, the way the program works um, is we provide 24 months of transitional housing assistance and case management supports, and then in turn um, prepare the tenants to become eligible for permanent Section 8 housing. So in that 65 individuals, 45 of those are children. So this was kind of surprising, um, as we do need the shelter for children and adults. Um, my career before this was as a social worker, and um, back before we had shelters that housed children, it was real difficult for us to find the children who were homeless. They're often in their cars or um, camping outside. Um, so, but I, I want to recognize that um, the cost of sheltering a person at the Lawrence Community Shelter is $25 a day. Actually, they're trying to get back down to that goal right now. 
per the um, recent study. And so for, uh, for the New Horizons, it costs an average of $6 a month or a night per person. So it was a real shock to me when I discovered that since 2016, those 65 individuals, we've saved about 900000 a little over $900,000 on. So um, I think that's a benefit to the community for that. It doesn't include the cost of savings uh, of decreased foster care involvement, health concerns, missed school and work. So um, we're asking for this funding today to cover the cost of another year of case management. Um, family, Brenda will talk more about Family Promise, but they're able to hire right away after we are awarded the grant. Um, and so that position started in February of 2019, so it looks to expire January of 2020. So we're asking for uh, coverage for another year so we can get through the 24 month time for these families. And we're also asking for the TBRA to help at least three to five more families. Um, so we're, the ask now, uh, the last grant we didn't get fully funded for was, uh, we didn't get 90,000 of the TBRA. And so now we're asking for that to be shifted and shared with more case management because, and Brenda will talk about more as to why. So right now we have 11 families involved with uh, New Horizons, four are leased up, five are searching, and two are awaiting funding um, to be able to be offered the housing assistance. And I think that's my part here. So, and our goal is to have 75% of those individuals successfully transition to permanent housing. I do wanna note on the grant, I put together the budgets, and in spirit of simplifying the budgets, um, on our uh, anticipated um, funding, I had for us this grant as 41%, but I did not include the leveraged funds from HUD. I did not include our other transitional housing uh, for homeless funds. I did not include the additional administrative uh, staff time, including mine. And so I just want to make note of that. So I want to uh, first acknowledge the eight-year-old artist who contributed the drawings for these slides today. She's a child of a family that Family Promise has served in the past years. Um, so to continue with what Nikki has already uh, told you about, um, we want to talk about if, if this funding is to, um, if we were awarded this funding for the upcoming year, um, as Nikki said, it would help us to serve three to five more families depending on their family size. Um, and that would include the two-year follow-up case management required once they move into housing, as well as the new families who move into the shelter to replace those who move out and those who are on the wait list as well. So it's um, able to serve several families that way. And as Nikki said, one of the objectives of the New Horizons program is that at least 75% of the families served on this transitional housing voucher would be able to um, either um, be, be able to provide their own housing without subsidy after these two years, or they would be able to transition to the general housing voucher, um, which is a more permanent subsidy for them. And so the supportive services that Family Promise is providing and that we are able to provide with the community resources and the other agencies that we're partnering with, um, they're key to helping these families be able to successfully move into this either non-subsidy or, or longer-term subsidy program. Um, this, the sustainability and self-sufficiency is, is a key part of this. So this is a list of some of the services that we're able to provide, um, as I said, in collaboration with other agencies in town. And I want to highlight a couple. Employment services is huge, of course, to be able to maintain permanent housing, and so we're working with families very intensely on that. And for those who are unable to work, then we're able to refer them into the SOARS program so that they have that um, Social Security. Uh, income so that they can support their family that way. We're focusing on housing ready, readiness, and part of that is a class that we've developed in partnership with the Lawrence Board of Realtors called Keys to Good Tenancy. And as of tonight, we will have finished that five-week class with the families at the shelter. So that's a key, key component of what we're doing with the families as well. Um, and access, as you know, access to these kinds of resources is going to improve these families' um, likelihood to remain stably housed and it's going to improve economic conditions for them, for the city in general, 
And be, being able to have that safe, affordable housing is going to help them thrive um, socially as well as economically. And they'll be able to spend more of their resources then on things like healthcare and um, food and transportation and other basic needs. Um, we believe that these families that we're working with can achieve safe, affordable housing, but we're learning a lot about this process too. Since we started five months ago, um, with the funding that you all awarded us um, in January, as Nikki said, we were able to begin working with the New Horizons program immediately at the shelter. And then in February, we hired a full-time case management position so that we could dedicate 40 hours a week or so to the program at the shelter. What we're finding is that this is a more in, um, time consuming process than we re recognized at first. And we are currently spending over 80 hours of staff time a week with families at the shelter um, and in um, helping to pr provide services and supports for them. We believe that this is due in part to the long stay that many of these families have had at the shelter that we're currently working with, nine to 15 months. And you are probably aware that if a family is homeless for over a year, that means in shelter, um, then they are considered chronically homeless and this creates even more barriers to finding um, permanent housing. Some of those things are listed there, but um, we are, it's taking some intensive case management to provide the resources and to help prepare these families to be ready to move into permanent stable housing. We don't want to just have the families move in and then not be able to maintain the housing. And so we're, we're working hard to help them pre prepare to be able to maintain that housing. We believe that moving forward, um, as, as current families um, move out, new families will move in. I want to back up a second, sorry, and say that one of the difficulties we've had is building the trust relationships with these families so they even understand why we're there working with them. When they've been there for a while and not had these services, now what are we doing there? So it's taking a while to build that trust and helping them recognize the benefit to, the, to our services. Um, but we believe moving forward, as these families move out and new families move in, we can begin working with the new families immediately upon move-in and um, establish that relationship right away and establish these um, things that we're working with them on, like employment and um, paying outstanding util utility bills and things like that. So they are ready to move in when the voucher is issued to them. So we believe that we can move families through the shelter faster. We won't see these long length of stays that we've, we've seen so far. Um, and then we, as more families move in, we can work, continue to work with those families as well. So we see this um, as being a real benefit to be, being able to work with more families. And I would like to just say one more point about that. Both of our agencies are part of uh, the planning to help Lawrence Community Shelter in their time of reorganizations, and so we're both uh, working with them to sign agreements to help them fill the gaps. And one of the things they recently, as I think of last week, they were, um, they had to eliminate their case management programming at the shelter um, to refocus on uh, safety and emergency shelter needs in order to hit that financial um, need of their budget. So many programs and organizations are helping fill those service gaps so they can focus on being a shelter right now. So um, that elimination has caused part of that 80 hours a week workload for Family Promise. So, Okay, any questions? Questions from the board? Yes. Do you have a, <clears throat> a long-term plan for this program? The long-term plan for this program um, would be to get these families into permanent vouchers, which then I also write grants to HUD to get more permanent vouchers. So we have this ability to serve more over longer term times. Um, I didn't put this in the ask, but we, we run about eight other uh, special voucher programs. This one really speaks to the community because of the need for more, uh, to be able to house these families families with children as soon as possible. And in 2016, that's kind of where we came with the city and county. Most of our other programs, we look for diverse fundings, including our program income for moving to work. So um, we fund ourselves 20 vouchers each year now for domestic violence survivors. 
uh, or people escaping domestic violence. We do five reentry uh, transitional vouchers each year for people working with the sheriff's office to get stabilized um, and out of jail. Uh, we also provide um, next step vouchers. Um, all these vouchers we're paying for out of our budget. Uh, next step is for kids aging out of foster care. And then um, the other funds we get through uh, Home HUD funding through city and state. Those have been reduced over the years. It's been a better year this year, but we have about 45 families on that list. So that can be up to 18 months of a wait, which is a lot for kids. So. Um, this is our, our avenue of helping fund this, so um, for the city and county. And we're hoping things stabilize eventually. We can catch up mm -hmm. with the need, you know. I mean, that's a larger picture, but I think with more affordable units, mm -hmm. more stabilized housing opportunities, this will get better, I hope. I would just add to that, too. Family Promise has a commitment to serve families who are homeless, whether that's through the New Horizons um, program or not, we continue to expand our services. We have this opportunity now to work in the New Horizons program, um, and we want to be a part of the solution in our community for ending family homelessness. So um, we have a commitment right now with those families that we're serving. We'll do the two-year follow-up with them to whenever that has to end. And if there's no more money for that, then we'll find other ways to, to as, a, as a part of the community, to approach the solution. So it's a community solution. It's not a, it's not mm -hmm. a mm -hmm. housing mm -hmm. authority or family promise mm -hmm. solution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, a question I would have regarding uh, services for these targeted constituencies. Um, a, apart from the you know, resources needed to scale up, just to operate at a bigger size, are there other barriers or obstacles? Are there... <laughs> You know, institutional obstacles. Mm -hmm. Are there, you know, community, you know, we're not as organized as we could be, or we've got some folks over here, you know, are, 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 are we getting the coordination of agencies and the linkages between agencies and funding sources to help you be as efficient and effective in your programming as you could be, or are the issues simply being able to scale? Um, I mean, that's yeah, there's a lot of answers I have for that, question. actually. I'm, I've First, kind of apologized I, for it. It's no, not, no, no, no. I'm, I'm trying to understand the no. context of no. this, this ask here. So mm -hmm. I think historically, I mean, you know, factors come and the results and the consequences are years sure. later. Mm -hmm. um, part of that is that, again, children were a very hidden homeless population. Um, mm -hmm. We have now have access to families, and so we're being a little more thoughtful in our planning of the unique struggles families have when they experience homelessness. Um, and so that's one piece. And so yeah, I think as agencies getting together, we're looking at some of this data, including the cost savings of how providing housing and getting ahead of the game, including prevention is cost savings. Uh, and I won't go into all of the consequences that and the trauma that is uh, part of the ACEs study and all that that homelessness causes on children. And another piece to that is untreated mental health. Um, and I think we're getting better as a community working on that right now. But you know, we can go all the way back to deinstitutionalization and housing if you want, because that's really a big issue in all of our programs together, is getting that. Um, also, a barrier can be criminal backgrounds. Um, and a lot of these families, this year, we're, they're, they're smaller family sizes, but we have families up to 10, 12, people, uh, that's a lot of housing. And so can't ever get ahead. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but these, uh, you know, we can serve up to uh, very low income in this program, but since 2016, every single family has been extremely low income. So we're talking about the most vulnerable uh, individuals in our commu community right now. And so that's why we really prioritize this group and ask for local funding to expedite the housing for them. Because as Brenda mentioned, you know, the longer you stay unhoused or homeless, and the more episodes of homelessness, it makes it harder to become uh, housed to get in the future. So, and there are several agencies in town who are working together on what's called the coordinated entry process. So we meet monthly and discuss what 
um, individuals or families we're working with and where housing is available to them. And so there is a community effort amongst agencies to, to address that. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Just ask a question of everybody. <laughs> um, so you, uh, in the last round, you guys asked for more, we gave you 110, I think, whatever, mm -hmm. out of that. Back this round, is there a plan to work your way out of that, or do you see us as part of your budget model, if you will, for the next 10 years while this lasts? Because this only lasts 10 years, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we're, I'm trying to figure out if we're part of your budget model and we're going to see you here every time we have a request or if there's a way you're working out of that or do you see the need dropping like you spoke to a little bit um i'm just trying to understand that. well i think the housing study said you know how many units are we still needing so i don't see right. that need dropping right away okay that's a community issue right. we're serving about you know right. close to 1300 <laughs> low-income uh, individuals and providing affordable housing. And we have great success rates. I mean, we've almost had 100 individuals right. buy houses. So I guess it's really the societal problem, and that's a community problem. But we yeah. are getting people, I mean, we are reducing costs per family, I right. guess is the way to look at that. Right. And so we've even had recently somebody who started off in our homeless transitional program and purchased a house and now a homeowner so yeah, I'm that's not at all questioning the value of your work that's no great stuff you're doing it's, it's just a hard phenomenal. thing to predict I would like to see I mean we yeah. did have we have 45 uh, veteran vouchers we have nationally reduced right. veteran homelessness I mean that's been announced and right. um, I'd like to really love to hear that children's homelessness is reduced but the need is still great um, but as far as this program it it I does mean, seem to be more yes, emergency based right now yeah. because of a lot of factors. I would love to see this program not be as um, dependent, on these children as dependent on us for this program. And you know, watching where the home grant goes and CDBG funds, I mean, all those things predict what we need. Right. Um, but I think we're about $9 million, so we try and be very creative with our leverage and our funds. And I'll tell you, I didn't understand this but we are a very unique housing authority in lawrence kansas douglas county most housing authorities in the state i think we may be the only one which Wichita's interested in trying for home they don't do these levels of programs and we offer several of them most of them are public housing section eight you might get to come and put your name in the hat on an application one day a year and it'll be you know right. told to you in the newspaper so we're we try to really meet the unique needs here for our community, so. Okay. I didn't really hear an answer to his question. Do we expect to see you back for another request next time we do this? Well, I'll tell you, I can't, I mean, possibly, yeah. I will okay. be honest, That's yeah. Fine. Yeah, maybe. Okay. Yeah. I don't think there's a right or a wrong. No, there's not. We're, yeah, we're going to struggle with, I mean, these it's are kind of been all great. The funding <laughs> source for this program before this board or this funding was available too, so. Um, but we also rely on the county. They have been uh, very generous each each year. So to date, the city started with county, city awarding us 100,000. The county, uh, since 2016, has awarded 50,000 per year. And then with this uh, uh, affordable housing trust fund, we got another 110 from you all. So probably equally about supported at this point, so. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, yes, excuse me. $100,000 in funding this time, how you will prioritize them? Um, well, we're fully obligated, so we will just wait until funding comes to provide the TBRA. Uh, we did put an ask in to, for 2020 from the county, so um, that was for 50000 so we would use that when that became available next year. As far as Family Promise, um, the original ask was a match, and they've already met that match in one year because of the high level of need. And so um, I don't, I can't speak to Dana's budget, but so maybe without that 40 hours a week potentially in January at yeah, 2020. Let, yeah, yeah. You'll pull it out. We, we're committed to the to finishing the, the program to whatever end that is, and so we'll figure out the funding. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
and Penn Street Loss. Good morning. Afternoon, rather. Yeah, Good afternoon. afternoon. My name is Patrick Watkins. I'm here on behalf of Tony Kresnick, uh, Ohio Mortgage Investors, the owner of the property there at 8th and Pennsylvania. Uh, I know you all have um, our application, and, and um, I'll try and keep this to sort of a top line review. And Tony Kresnick is here with me, and he's available for comments or questions. He may have a couple of follow-up comments. Um, I know I might miss a couple things. This is a broad project, and this is a big project. It's a unique opportunity for our community. Um, and I say that for several reasons. It, first of all, adds 48 individual affordable housing units, um, which we know is about half the very first priority of the housing study. Um, that on its own is a remarkable amount. Um, but it, if fully funded by AHAB uh, to our request, it would result in about a, one unit per $12,500, which we think is a, is a great return on, on investment and good value for uh, the investment that we're requesting. We also think it's a unique project. Um, in addition to the size, uh, we think that the location itself uh, has the ability to impact the greater community in a new way. This is in East Lawrence. This is in the Warehouse Arts District, which we know is changing rapidly. Um, we know that there's a need for affordable housing. And, and an increase in the supply of this amount, we think, will have a much broader uh, result on the area in general. Um, and, and I think it's noteworthy, and I, and I want to bring that uh, to your attention, because this is in one of the cultural hearts of the city. East Lawrence has always been a working class neighborhood. Uh, and we think it's completely appropriate and needed to make some adjustments uh, to the housing supply in that area. We think this is unique, of course, because this is also a LIHTC project, and it's received a substantial allocation of federal tax credits uh, from the State Housing Corporation. Um, that allocation will afford this development to be designed in an insightful, culturally conscious way. This is going to be a state-of-the-art, modern, uh, affordable housing complex. When you think about the broad range of affordable housing that we're hearing about today. By the way, we're, we're especially pleased to be considered among such uh, a broad group of people requesting these funds with such worthy proposals and projects. But when you think about the, the scope of affordable housing, um, there is room and there is need to have not only in the culturally significant areas of town, but also insightful, uh, modern, first-rate developments uh, for affordable housing. So this is a unique project, and we're asking for you all to think about this in a unique way. We know that you don't have $600,000 in your trust fund right now. Um, we know that this money is going to be needed uh, to complete this project. <clears throat> and to, to Scott's point earlier in, in the morning, uh, we specifically call out and invite the opportunity to, for our request to be completely contingent upon the city and the third parties gap funding analysis. We think that's a requirement that you all should consider not only for our project, for all projects uh, that, that do get LIHTC funds. I think it's a completely appropriate uh, response. Um, and so we're seeking a little bit different, um, so broader support from your board. Um, we know that you're looking for a return in 2020. And frankly, this, this project is going to take long enough to to get approvals from the city boards and planning commission and city commission. Uh, it has to go to, through design re review. We don't think we'll probably start building until 2020. Um, and you may not get any units in 2020. Um, so we've made the election to plant the seed, in a sense, with your board uh, to consider this uh, application, not as a, a request for funding of the 250,000 that, that you have to decide on now, but as an opportunity to think broadly about this project, its impact on, on the community, and how it might be funded uh, over the next two funding cycles. Um, we think this is the sort of project that merits that sort of consideration. Um, you have plenty of hard decisions to make today. Uh, we don't think this necessarily has to be one of them. 
Um, we are open to your consideration if, if you'd like to give it for this project. We'd certainly like to be graded among the projects, um, but we'd, we'd like to have another opportunity to come before your board, re request a resolution of support, uh, and a recommendation that our project be fully funded. Completely contingent upon a gap analysis stating that these funds are absolutely necessary for this project, um, both by the city and by a third party. Um, Tony is here. Uh, I'm here. There's obviously plenty of questions that could be asked about the design of this project, but considering uh, we are not asking that you grant us any of the 250000 you, you have plenty of projects to decide which ones to fund this year. We'd certainly like to be considered among them, but we think this is a broader project, potentially for future funding. Very good. Patrick. Questions? Or a lead off? I guess. I'm a lead off hitter, I guess. Um, future funds. So, are, you know, would you be looking, would, when would the project need the funds? Would they need the funds, you know, December of this year, December of next year? The, you know, yeah. What what is your horizon when you? We think January 1st, 2020 is the day we want to be funded. We think that we'll be able to get through the entitlement process, through the city's uh, processes before the end of the year. Um, and if it, it's my understanding there's another application process you all are contemplating before the end of the year. I think it's probably right at that time. Scott, you can weigh in if you'd like. I think that's fair to think about. Would that be a commitment of funds or would that be? The actual funds for the project. Funds needed, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> funds needed, we, we plugged it into uh, the project timeline and construction. Uh, we could receive them over the course of, you know, once at, at the beginning of 2020, once at the beginning of 2021. So at least a portion of it at the beginning of 2020. We could do the whole amount over the two-year period. Okay. And the same question we've asked everybody, if we don't, if you don't get the funds, what happens I, to this project? I think we're looking at a different project. We're not looking... Yeah, and, and Tony will come up. I'll, I'll say it, and I've asked or him this question. Or partial funding or, yeah. you know, whatever. This is, a, this is an obvious question, in my opinion, because this is uh, such an ornately and well-designed building. We're probably looking at a project that's less. Um, you've seen uh, great housing projects in Lawrence and across the state, but you don't have to design them this well, and you don't have to build them this well. Mm -hmm. um, so I think you're looking at less of a project, but Tony can weigh in. Yeah. Uh, my name is Tony Kresnick. I'm the CEO of Flannels Holdings Group, and this project that we're contemplating would be the ninth project in what's now commonly known as the Warehouse Arts District that I've done or financed over the last uh, six years. Um, I wanted to make a comment earlier um, when uh, the gentleman from Wheatfield um, um, was, was talking, but wasn't sure if it was appropriate. And full disclosure, I am on the board with Mr. Rhodes at the Kansas Housing Association, but in, in answer to staff's question, well, low income housing and tax credit equity is a source of gap financing. I, I don't know if that was a technical question, but from a practical standpoint, no, it is not. Um, it is the source of financing. And whether or not you look at the projects that we've done with you all and here in Douglas County, schoolhouse lofts, polar lofts, nine Dell lofts, projects that we've done, um, Parsons, Kansas, just started our second phase in Fort Scott, Kansas. Every single one of these projects needs gap financing. And whether or not that's in the form of a uh, of a of a TIF, a tax rebate, standard now is 95 percent, 15 year uh, tax rebate, CDBG funds, which in theory are great, although they trigger prevailing wages or Davis Bacon wages that actually can take you in the wrong direction. You know the the list goes on, but let's make no mistake about it. In fact, oftentimes here in the Midwest and flyover country where you don't have CRA investors that can pay 95, 96 plus cents on the dollar like they, like they can on the east, west coast, Colorado, Texas. Uh, it's, about the only th it's about the only game in town which automatically defaults to a true gap financing situation. So I think that, you know, in the Tax Reform Act of 1986, when they contemplated the Section 42 program, it was a way to finance in some cases, in our case, in flyover states in its entirety, um, the project using equity derived from the sale of those tax credits. So, so I did I did want to make mention of that. So what does that translate in terms of my project? Can't speak for anybody else. My project uh, 
creates something for everybody. Pat mentioned there was a 48 unit project. That's 48 affordable units. We have a total of 71 units. So 33% of our project is market rate. In addition to that, 4,000 square feet of commercial space, which depending on the type of tenant will create 65 to 85 permanent jobs, just like we've seen at Bond Bond, Lawrence Beer Company, anywhere throughout town. Um, so so th there, there, there is a primary difference. And I was just taking notes because I thought it was very interesting how people describe their projects, and I agree, and I think that every one of them are great. What that results in, in terms of turnover, we would actually serve 1,065 individuals and families over a two-year turnover cycle, 710 families over a three-year turnover cycle. The estimated development of $13 million from $6 million requests would result in a 22 times leverage project not included the benefit of the permanent jobs. And this project, as a reminder, also contemplates eventual home ownership. At the end of the 15-year period, we'd like to go to the market and have these come to the mar come on to the market as condos. And although I have not been asked this question, somebody said, somebody asked a question earlier, if, uh, I believe it was of Mr. Rhodes again, well, would you consider having these projects remain affordable in perpetuity? In all honesty, we've heard horror stories, such as in California, where there's been 50-year lures. The projects themselves aren't standing 50 years. The neighborhoods have changed. You, you, you have a, a lure on a property. The city would rather it be a, a hospital. The city would rather it be a, um, you know, a gas station, a, a fire station. So for those reasons, this, these programs were designed to be 30 years, which is running the dual course one these buildings, right, wrong, or different, as well built as they are, and they are built better in many regards than market rate, they don't last 30, 40, 50 years, again, as the fine people of California would tell us. The markets, the neighborhoods change, and for those reasons, 30 years, which would put us after a build beyond 2051, you know, it's, it's a good opportunity to take a step back. So although that question wasn't asked to me, I did want to make a comment to that. In regards to the $600,000 investment, Again, we could take that money over a couple of different cycles. What we're mainly looking for is the investment itself um, and, and the commitment. In terms of the land, I've purchased the land, I've amassed the land, we own the land. In terms of the tax credits themselves, 690,000 annual allocation. To put that in perspective, in addition to 33 to 35 market rate units and 4,000 square feet of, of commercial space, we are talking about one of, if not the largest, 9% developments that has been awarded to the entire region outside of Colorado, possibly since the inception of the program. And I can, I can, I can tell you that the impact uh, will be beyond anything that the state of Kansas has seen from this program. Um, sorry, I'm taking a look at my notes here. We've been awarded the credits. I own the land. The debt commitments have been made. And I think that that's all I wanted to make mention of. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions from the board? Seeing none. Yes, please. Um, if, um, Tony, if you might be able to comment on this, I know that your the application speaks to this, but maybe you could um, talk a little bit about the the status of applying for the city through another process, the Economic Development Funds, for the uh, Neighborhood Revitalization Act incentive and then industrial revenue bonds that I know that you indicated on here. It's that, but that's an addition to the 600,000, is that correct? Yes, they're totally unrelated programs. It's my understanding that Housing Trust Fund does not have the authority to award a tax rebate nor issue IRBs. I just wanted to make everyone aware that that our understanding is the intention to apply for that which would be on a different a, you know a, kind of a different course yeah yeah and if, and if we want to talk about other sources of financing we'll also have a construction bridge permanent loan the estimated in loan on the permanent debt will be four million dollars which is why the IRBs and the 95 percent 15-year tax rebate is so critical so that we can mortgage the property to the hilt, for lack of a better term, and reduce our requests to bodies like yours. Uh, Tony, uh, yeah. I, I know the comment was made, I think, earlier today, and you, or, or you may have made it, that 
the 15 year, 95% abatement has become kind of the standard. Is that driven by any kind of federal program spec? I mean, or, or has the marketplace just settled on those numbers? Or, or is there some criteria or, or, or minimum or maximum out there in the marketplace that's, that's causing that before these abatement programs are settling out? We're seeing that more so in the Midwest than anywhere else. We're active in Kansas, Missouri, Oklahoma, Iowa. We just received an award three months ago in the state of Iowa for the two largest projects in the state. And the reason that we're seeing them on projects in the Midwest with permanent debt is because when you have to underwrite your expenses at a 3% increase, but your income only at a 2% increase, you run into a problem later in the, later in the cycle of the 15 year compliance period. So you gotta keep in mind that the investor and their recapture and their risk lasts for the entire 15 years. And that's why we've asked for the 95% tax rebate in the state of Kansas and the state of Missouri. It's done through an abatement process. But here in, here in Kansas, whether or not that's nine dell lofts, schoolhouse lofts in Baldwin City, both projects in Fort Scott, Parsons, we asked for that full 95-15 so that the investor can judge what their jump and operating expense, or in this case, lack thereof is. What we do with that savings is that additional net operating income gives us the ability to go out and take out more permanent debt. So I think you know people that are familiar with this program would tell you that possibly they haven't heard of a $4 million permanent debt project in the state of Kansas, and that's what we currently have it underwritten to. In regards to the, in regards to the uh, IRBs, the IRBs is just a simple way of saving a little bit of money on our, um, on our material costs. Uh, so that we can, you know, do things like go forth with the green, excuse me, the green initiatives that you, that you see in, in your packet so that we can go in with as much energy efficient uh, units as possible so that we can do what we said we were going to do at the state level and that is our project of the affordable units themselves. We have 30%, 40%, 50%, and 60% with hopes of doing income averaging including 70 and 80% units under the affordable umbrella. One of the 30% units is designed for a transitional and homeless unit. 40% units and below 20% of our affordable units will meet, 19, 20% will meet that criteria. In addition to that 50%, I'm sorry, 20% of our 50% AMI units will also meet that criteria. So um, hopefully you'd agree with, with that, that we're trying to meet a, a wide variety of uh, income. Uh, across the community and again in addition to that 33 to 35 percent of the units will also be market rate completely unrestricted thank you I have a question yes um, I'm curious about the the 48 units and the the mix of units uh, how do you make that decision that nine studios 31 one bedrooms and eight two bedrooms is that locked in pretty much or is there still some flexibility in that there's still flexibility. It was based upon our market. Um, our three bedroom, the number, the number one units we have a tough time leasing are our three bedroom affordable units at Polar and Nine Dell Off. So something that was very surprising to our team. One bedrooms and two bedrooms do very well. Throughout the United States, we, you know, you, you hear about the rave, especially on the coast and now on the West Bottoms in Kansas City. Even people are producing micro units or a even smaller version of a studio unit. So what we did was we used the, the data, we looked at our waiting list. Um, throughout, you know, people hopefully find other places to live, but at one point we had over 200 people on the residential waiting list alone. And we, we took a look at that waiting list. What were they waiting on? Primarily they were looking for ones and twos. Some market rates were looking for threes. Hardly any affordable families were looking for the threes. A lot of these are single, single parent situations. And we heard a lot of people that were looking for something more affordable, something smaller, didn't necessarily care about having the walls, didn't have a ton of stuff, didn't need a ton of storage. And so we uh, designed studio units. In answer to your question, at this point, we are open to changes, but they would obviously need to be market driven, especially in this case where you have a uh, permanent investor that's gonna be allocating $4 million plus. Other questions? Yes. There are not. We're a community that's in the warehouse arts district. You know, we, you wouldn't be able to put the age restrictions on it. A lot of lot of our lot of our tenants are um, 
tenants that are working multiple jobs, you know, young single parents, one, two kids. So it, it wouldn't be an opportunity to do any restriction on the age. Thank you very much, Tony. Thank you. Okay. Um, excellent presentations. Thank you for all very much. And now we've got the enviable task of sorting through all the information and making some decisions. Uh, shall we talk about timeline and procedures a little bit? Yes, I'm going to ask Danielle if she could cover that as well okay. as the application materials the or the um, scoring sheets that you have in front of you. I might head up there just so I'm not oh, talking to fine. everybody's Certainly. back. Certainly. <laughs> All right, so uh, we thought we'd talk a little bit about kind of timeline and next steps. Um, so before the meeting started, I did hand out um, kind of the, the scoring matrix that you guys will be asked to fill out. Um, so today was really, if you go to our procedures, today was the meeting where we had all of the applicants come uh, present, allow you guys to ask questions. Our next meeting will be in a, a week from today, um, and that's where um, we will need all of your scores um, and we'll throw that into the, the project detail sheet along with some updates based on the conversations and questions that we had today. So we will have an updated project uh, element sheet attached to that agenda, uh, but we will need uh, the scoring sheets filled out by each of you, initialed by each of you by the end of July 3rd. So it doesn't give you a whole lot of time. You're welcome to send it on July 4th, but no one will be here. Um, so we, we need some time to actually put those together um, so that'll give us July 5th to put that together and get that agenda out. I, I, I will not be able to make the July 3rd, but okay. I have to commit to the 5th. I'm sorry, but my schedule is completely booked right now. And so I can get, I can get to you on 5th by noon, but I need okay. a little more time. Okay. okay. As, as early as you can, because we need I some time to compile it as well. And our, our meeting is, okay. is Monday. Mm -hmm. so. Um, so I uh, just wanted to kind of highlight that. Um, um, let's see. Are, are there any other questions that that you guys have kind of on the the, the process? It's a pretty condensed um, timeline. We will be. We, the reason why we wanted that um, ahead of the meeting is so that we can post all that publicly, both the um, this updated matrix with with the scores with the score. on it as well as your individual score sheets. So that's what we're trying to do and, and give, you know, give everybody enough time to review in advance. So the, the meeting, I need more than 40 hours right now. So the, the next meeting would be just to review our scores or? So what you'll do at the next meeting then is you will have, this will be updated for you. At least you'll start with seeing the scores compared to one another for each of the different applications, and then you can begin your deliberations with however you wish to proceed with, um, with, with doing that so that you end up with um, a recommendation that you can formulate to the city commission where you're articulating the reasons for um, recommending what you're recommending. And are, are we against any kind of hard timeline for that needs to be completed Monday of next week? I saw that there's a, a date already published for when uh, the commission is to receive our recommendations <laughs> later in the month. We did have that anticipated and calendared. Um, it could be moved um, if that's something that you believe you needed additional time to deliberate. I think the challenge is um, then scheduling another meeting of this group um, in advance of your regularly scheduled August meeting. So that's just a question of timing for, mm -hmm. for the board, but um, and and perhaps then communicating to the commission, which we can, which we can do the um, the unupdated schedule. If we were trying to attempt to meet your um, direction and goal of getting something out the first part of this year versus yeah. getting too, yeah. too deep into yeah. it, but, but these are 
Yeah. So we have to react to today's the, midpoint to the great <laughs> projects that you have and the number mm -hmm. of them and the complexity of some of them too. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, it would affect time too much if we allow the next week's deliberation to <coughs> be included in our scoring or process wise that would just push things back too far. Uh, but I, I think I, I think the process that that we've discussed in the past is having each of us independently score and then and then see where those those averages are and then have a full discussion of all the projects um, uh, but I, I think I think you know we've got a fairly diverse board and the members that aren't here in order to participate in discussions need to review the video of all of today's presentations and they understand that those that aren't going to be conflicted out of that decision making process when will that be available? the video um kurt when is that the video is going to really post it yeah it's posted live right yeah yeah thank you kurt okay will we have these digitally or do we need to work on that we, we can send them out digitally as well. I just wanted to make sure that you guys also had a paper copy because we will need them to be initialed. So at some point, you right. can either fill it out electronically, print it off, sign it, and then get it to us or Good. do that, do it through the paper okay. version. So you would email that to us? Or we, it would be we'll we'll, we'll follow up and we'll email it mm -hmm. out to the board so that you have it. Yeah, it's on one of these future or one of these past uh, agendas, but it'd probably be easier just to send it all to you and in an email that way you have it at the top of your email list mm -hmm. any other discussion about the assignment or next steps or do you all want to rush off to lunch and start pouring over your notes and filling out uh, <laughs> the required well, paperwork sorry to do that to all of you in a busy week I know I did have a question about um, how much city support of more than 40 percent how will I know that this is that going to be clear to me that the city? I'm are looking you, at the form. Are you asking the I'm leverage city support of more than forty percent? Which one are you looking at? I'm sorry. Look at this the leverage. I'm looking at the leverage. Yeah. Oh. It's the scoring sheet. The scoring sheet. The leverage. Yeah, the leverage ratio. Yeah. Um, and your question is. Are you talking about the? Oh, monitor? the in, the individual the individual projects in the minutia of the information they provided us As whether the city are telling us whether they're what the level of support is right for and, and in some cases we went back and really looked and there needed to be a little bit of recalculation um, we want to make sure that um, that it's a it's indicating the the leverage of um, what the the trust fund dollars are going to be um, to the um, remainder of the funds that will be leveraged to make the project as a whole. Okay. So since you stated as a percentage on one sheet and a ratio on the other, hmm. can we just put a slash and put the percentage of city funding on the group in this sheet just to make it really clear for everybody? Is that possible? Which and so on, on this sheet, yep. it's a percentage of the funding, so like 40%, yep. it's one score or whatever. Can we put the percentage of city funding? So like independence is a 50% city funding and I don't know. So you're looking at their leverage ratio? Yeah. Uh, I don't know that that leverage ratio represents the same thing as city funding. Oh, it does it different. Right. No, those are, those are two different. That's because there were only two funding sources to work on that. Yeah. You're right. Mm -hmm. So how are we going to determine this? I think just a piece of information to know how many other public taxpayer dollars are going into the project outside of the trust fund money, and, and one is leveraging some of that as well. That makes sense. Right. So there are two different data points for your consideration. Mm -hmm. Because there are different sources of city funding that come from different revenue streams. Some of them property tax, um, sales tax, uh, transfers from the state, different things that they may be eligible to receive. And then there's this local sales tax fund, 
which is the trust fund. There could be okay. CDBG and I'm, home funding and, and different things. Okay, I'm, I'm now more confused. <laughs> so so on, on, on the long page, on the long page, when we're talking about leverage ratio, key we're, talking about, we're talking about the ratio of Ahab requested funds to, to all, the, other all other funds that have been attracted for the project. Right, and there are some caveats like the, um, like the New Horizons source. They used in their application, um, they used last year's award as the leverage point, and I think we discounted that because mm -hmm. you can't, you shouldn't, we shouldn't be using trust funds to leverage trust funds. Yeah. Last but if there, were this other, year, this year. if there were other funding yeah. sources, we allowed those. So that's what the leverage ratio means, because that's okay. been an important mm -hmm. element of the discussion. Um, and, so that's and, how then, and then the that. number on the small chart, when, if, if a project, if a project has city support of more than 40%, it means what? I'm trying to figure out where the small chart is on the work. The, the, this, this program score, chart, score yeah. sheet, if, if a project has less than 40% funding, yeah. what does that mean? The 40% of mean? the funding coming from the city is AHAP funds? Or I, I, I'm, I'm not understanding what that means. I know we had a metric that we were trying to get to when we set this up, and I've lost sight of it. Uh, Anyone remember? Yeah, so I think what, what Scott's talking about is on the scoring sheet that city support is encapsulating all city support, whether it's trust fund dollars or CDBG dollars, home dollars, and capturing all of that versus on this key project element sheet, it's just looking at the affordable housing sales tax so dollars. I think what they're asking for is can we provide them on the key elements? Yeah, is that just a data yes. point? That data as opposed to us because we may not all right. calculate so, the same and give a different so rate. If you know that, I mean, because you've got an idea of what that is, can you just send us what that, what on each one it is? So I think, um, at we, we certainly can. I think this is one of the points that, you know, as we were going through this scoring matrix that we were talking about in terms of do we want it to be scalable? Um, because if it, let's say, it has a, a percentage of requesting 5%, that looks a little bit different than if it's that 17% that because that still fits in that same box. But because of how we have it captured right now in that if it's in that high alignment, it automatically receives a score of 5 versus there being variability within that, I think we could probably look at that and put that together. Yeah, the, the application that I can think of that we may be challenged with that unless um, um, Mr. Krisnick can help us with it in his numbers is the value of the economic development package, right. which I don't, not having an application from them, I don't know exactly what that estimate might be, but at least we could get it in one of these three categories for you. To be able to score it, you need the data point. Mm -hmm. Right. And you're, besides digging in and calculating it out, it's going to be challenging to get. So we can look at that. I do not think we will have that ready, though, by the time we send you out the email, because um, we I would like to get that to you as, as quickly after this meeting as we possibly can. OK, so now it's going to be later that we have all the data that we want, but we've got to get it to you in a pretty quick. OK. I have unfortunately another question. <laughs> um, Sam and that they are not a construction project. So do we use this same form for them? There is a non-capital one yeah, that should be the very uh, last uh, one in the uh, uh, in the package. Because yes, yeah, that one is a little bit for project. Oh, non-capital project. Okay, I found it. I found it. Sorry. Mm -hmm. And what do we do about uh, the folks that just presented to us that aren't really asking for money this time? I think the, as I heard what their request was, was to go ahead and be scored with the other um, sheets, but then I think that that's going to be part of your deliberations. And again, mm -hmm. I think um, notwithstanding how your, how your um, combined scores come out, um, if the board decides to go a different direction from what your combined scores 
are, that's okay. Mm -hmm. In other words, if you're if you're best scoring project ends up not being funded as long as you've had an appropriate discussion as to why that would be um, and your rationale that you can relay to the city commission that would be appropriate mm -hmm. we did say that the scores would be one of the considerations I remember yes. that discussion. Mm -hmm. correct and that's indicated in your policies too yeah okay. interesting conversation <laughs> anything else all right, um, let's see, turn to the agenda briefly. Other new business, do we have any other new business? Next meeting is Monday of next week. Future agenda items, we will revisit our six applicants and our scoring and uh, go about making some decision making, prioritizing our funding availability. Thank you all very much. We're adjourned.